I will uh, start the recording now, if that's okay with everybody. And then um, you can find the link to this recording as well as the other recordings of our webinars on our YouTube after the, after the webinar. So I'd like to welcome everybody to this latest installment of the Iowa OER webinar series, where we cover topics that are relevant to people doing OER work in the state, whether that you know, is creating open educational resources or supporting um, OER programs or working in open pedagogy. Um, if you have topics of interest that you'd like to see covered in these webinars, you can always send us a message through the Iowa OER Action Team listserv. Um, I posted some links in the chat. One is to our Iowa OER website, which also has um, a link on that site to the mailing list, into the, I mean, to our listserv and to other resources as well. And I've also put um, a link to Dr. Baran's um, website in the chat as well. So. Um, my name is Mariah Burnett, and I'm a scholarly communications librarian at the University of Iowa. And I'm joined today by Dr. Evren Baran, who is an associate professor of educational technology and human computer education at Iowa State University. Um, Dr. Baran completed her PhD in curriculum and instructional technologies with a co-major in human computer interaction at Iowa State. She received a postdoctoral fellowship from the University of British Columbia. And as a supervisor of learning technologies and teacher education research group, which is abbreviated LATTE, uh, the overarching goal of her research is to advance theories, research, tools, and practices of learning technologies within teacher education, engineering education, and STEM learning contexts. She's been the principal investigator of several national and international funded projects that have examined mobile, online, and blended learning models, as well as classroom sensing and analytics technologies in teacher education and professional development. Her work was recognized by numerous awards at educational organizations, including AERA, AECT, and CITE. She, she teaches courses on technologies, online learning, instructional design, development, and evaluation. And you can find more about her work at everinbaran.com, which I put in the chat. And in this particular webinar, um, she will be sharing her work on open pedagogy action model, which uh, she developed and implemented in different higher education course contexts. The Open Pedagogy Action Model empowers learners in the co-creation of course content and helps them contribute to the body of knowledge they learn. The presentation will include some exemplary practices, pedagogical strategies, and recommendations for face-to-face, -face, blended, and online courses. So um, I'd like everybody to keep their microphones muted during the presentation. If you have questions or comments, feel free to type them in the chat, and um, we'll try to leave the last 15 minutes or so for, uh, for questions and discussion. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Evren Baran. Thank you, Mario, for the invitation. It's great to be here. I see familiar faces. <laughs> and I always love connecting to librarians. Uh, that's the first thing I do when I go to an institution. So I'm hoping to continue these conversations after the webinar as well. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. And hopefully you can see it. Is that okay? Perfect. Okay, so um, I'm Evrin Baran. I'm an associate professor of educational technology in the School of Education at Iowa State University. And today I'll talk about our work on open pedagogy in action. So a little bit information about me, you can simply Google my name and you will see some of these platforms where I share my work, um, um, the products we develop in our projects, as well as our research. And I am a firm believer of connecting and growing together. So feel free to connect with me after the webinar. Um, and I will also share the slides on Twitter um, and upload those on Google sites as well. So you can access those later on. So um, as mentioned, um, I'm leading a research group at Iowa State University on learning technologies and teacher education. In short, we call latte because we all love uh, coffee and latte. And uh, this research group really centers around understanding the use of the value of using technologies in teacher education context. So we design, develop, and evaluate online, mobile, and open STEM education uh, environments. We do look at um, the multimodal learning analytics of classroom behavior and develop technology-enhanced learning environments. We do a lot of work on teacher professionals 
professional development. And this uh, group is really an interdisciplinary group. So we have people from design, engineering, education, trying to address complex problems of education in today's society. And I think interdisciplinary work is key to understanding to those of those problems. So um, a little bit about my research background on online teaching and learning. So my scholarship in this field in the last two decades have explored some of these areas. And as you can see, I did a little bit work on virtual collaboration, virtual teams, online discussions, and uh, developed uh, models for online teacher education, both in uh, for pre-service and in-service um, uh, programs. I looked a lot on effective online teaching and successful practices and my work on open pedagogy is kind of extension of that as an as a practice within higher education context. And recently, actually last three years of our work on open pedagogy is also centered around this whole idea of human centered approach to design of online um, learning environments and I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of today's webinar session. Uh, and I want to start with uh, some background on what's happening in education right now um, in, within the last year. Uh, and we have been going through a very challenging time and um, this is going to have long lasting impact, not only in health um, um, issues, but also in the society. And I've been following Zeynep Tufekci, she's a media scholar and critique, and she has uh, this recent article in The Atlantic and she says, the pandemic has given us an unwelcome societal stress test revealing the cracks and weaknesses in our institutions and our system. So there were cracks, um, there were issues and they become more visible. Um, and uh, this is really true um, in educational institutions. And UNESCO published a report um, last summer on um, COVID-19 outbreak as a major education crisis. So more than 1.5 billion students and youth across the planet are or have been affected by school and university closures due to COVID-19 pandemic. And a lot of issues around um, social justice, equity, access to resources uh, have become more visible and evident. And um, this crisis has resulted in a paradigm shift on how learners of all ages uh, can access learning and therefore it is essential as a global community to come together and foster the universal access to information and that's where the OER comes uh, as an important vision and there has been a lot of work in this area in the last two decades or so but I um, as an educational technology researcher I'm seeing more work will be coming in this field especially um, in, globally around the world in different areas. Um, so um, this is an ongoing work and our work kind of builds on this initial problem. And uh, I am an optimist scholar. I think all problems can be solvable in education as long as we identify the problems together and as long as we uh, have this optimist mindset and approach this as a problem solving um, um, uh, view. So um, I won't go into too much detail of OER, and I see Abby here, and um, and she's she's a great scholar, and I, I'm a passionate follower of her work, and she's been a great support at Iowa State University, and I watched her webinar recording on YouTube. She uh, talks a lot about these, uh, but I just want. To mentioned that OER is part of a teaching, learning, and research resource initiative, right? So, our um, my talk today will mostly focus on using this as a teaching uh, resource. Um, so, and we kind of um, focus on this um, move from OER to open educational practices. And um, there is an increasing number of, of OER materials or, or, or courses and so forth, but there is a need to move beyond technocentric, technology focused and content centered approaches to open educational practices, in short, we call OEP. And openness increases access to resources, expanded opportunities for learners to contribute, share, connect, and conduct. So how do we look at this as an, as an educational practice, as a pedagogical practice? So that is the center of our work um, here. And um, open educational practices are collaborative practices that include the creation, use, and reuse of OER. So a lot of um, emphasis on pedagogy here, participatory technologies, 
um, learner interaction, peer learning, and a big focus on empowerment. So empowering learners in the co-creation of the content they learn. So I talk, I'll give you examples today how we implement open educational practices in our context. So under the open educational practice umbrella, we focus on open pedagogy and it is defined as an ability to optimize the full potential of learning uh, whereby students create and curate their own content and contribute to the public domain. Um, and they also practice 5R permissions, retain, reuse, revise, remix and redistribute. This is an educational vision that empowers students and educators as agents of knowledge production. And I'll come back to this point again, why it's important um, that we, we need to focus on student agency uh, and empowerment. Some of the other related concepts, and I also share the references here um, um, related to open pedagogy. This is not new. This has been um, out there for, for some time. People have been doing work on open scholarship, uh, participatory scholarship, critical digital pedagogy, and open pedagogy. And uh, what we noticed in our work, as we try to define open pedagogy, people have different definitions, different understandings about OEP, open pedagogy and so forth. So um, it is a little confusing actually when you start working in this area to identify these uh, definitions. But I think this literature would help anyone interested in these topics. So Hegarty in 2015 uh, defines the attributes of open pedagogy and some of these really resonate well with what we do at ISU. Um, using participatory technologies, um, focusing on people, openness and trust, innovation and creativity, sharing ideas and resources, focus on connected community, learner generated content, ongoing reflective practice and peer review. So these are some of the attributes we also adapted to our work at Iowa State University. And there are several benefits of open pedagogy. Um, it strengthens students' understanding of the information about ownership, who owns what, copywriting, licenses, and responsibilities. And um, this is a very important outcome of open pedagogy. So students in studying all topics as they go through these um, um, activities they can practice these um, you know how do they work with open content how do they create how do they gather information and i think this is an important skill for students we need to teach them about these skills um, and it challenges traditional instructional strategies and transform teachers and learning experiences altering the balance of power around knowledge access and shifting the role of teacher from the source of knowledge to the facilitator of knowledge. And um, uh, maybe Abby mentioned before, but Iowa State University has now a, a website with a collection of uh, professors, faculty implementing um, open educational resources in their classrooms. Uh, I think they are um, shared in the OER Trailblazers website. And it's uh, it's great to see, you know, that a lot of faculty now are recognizing a need from this shift of role from you know, the power center of their classrooms to more facilitators of knowledge. And you will see some of those examples there as well. And it offers individuals authentic and meaningful learning experiences. So how we do it, we do implement open pedagogy through renewable assignments. And these are just one example, the um, examples of open pedagogy practices. They are in contrast to assignments that are discarded after the course courses and you, they use OER to create value for a larger community by encouraging the learner in the creation and sharing of OER materials. I've been implementing and using renewable assignments in my courses uh, for a decade now. And I, I'm just passionate about this approach because when students regularly in traditional classrooms work on assignments, they're, they're, they just stay there. Right, they're, they're disconnected from students' future work or from future students. But I'll give examples of renewable assignments to you today that kind of connects your students, our students, with a broader community. And there are several inspirations of my work. And I, I would like to acknowledge these people because um, you know my work builds on, on um, this initial work. So there are several examples of renewable assignments online. Um, in different platforms, um, all these um
geographic context. And a big inspiration for me has been Robin De Rosa, and she's a national leader in open pedagogy. And she and her colleagues uh, prepared this open pedagogy notebook, um, openpedagogy.org. There is a great collection of resources for educators interested in learning more about open pedagogy. And um, of course, a big inspiration and big resource for me as a faculty at Iowa State University is the Iowa State Library. And um, I mentioned whenever I go to a new institution, the first people that I connect to are librarians. And uh, because I'm, I'm inspired by librarians. And um, so Iowa State University, when I started working here in 2018, I think started these initiatives around promoting the growing number of instructors utilizing OER. And um, they encourage instructional innovation, there's a great uh, website, but there are also great resources for us. So the Miller Open Education mini grant was one of the resources that was initiated and supported our work on open pedagogy. And uh, we received the grant and we started implementing this um, work in a number of courses, but as a researcher, I also wanted to see the impact and wanted to examine, okay, we do this, we implement these approaches, but what is the impact of it on students, right? So we developed um, an open pedagogy and action model, and we do a lot of design research with my team, uh, and we integrated these practices in our courses and um, examined the impact of those um, renewable assignments um, to see how empowerment of learners can have an effect on their outcomes and um, how students get to develop uh, their agency uh, within these activities. So this is our research on open pedagogy. We looked at how students perceive uh, these processes, challenges and affordances, and also how do they perceive the impact of open pedagogy practices on their knowledge and awareness of open access and agency. So through our design work, we developed this model and this is an ongoing work. So we are still adapting uh, this model. We are still changing to this model. Uh, this is one interesting thing about teaching about online learning. It's just you teach something and next time it's totally different because technology changes, content changes rapidly. So this model is, is a work in progress, but we developed this model through our design research. This is the open pedagogy in action model. Um, as, as students go through open um, pedagogy renewable assignments, they um, you know, participate into these components that we have here. So reflection, development, content creation, peer feedback and community engagement are critical components here. Throughout all these processes, there is an ongoing scaffolding and instructor feedback. And I'll talk about how important it is to scaffold the whole process. And I'll give you examples soon. So um, our work is published in Distance Education Journal's special issue on uh, going forward with open educational practices. And if you're interested in learning more about OEP and some of the critical perspectives in this field, this is a great special issue. Um, and there's a lot of work around here, trust, openness, diversity, and inclusion, so great uh, issue that was edited by Suzanne Kessel, Aras Oskurt, and Leo Heyman. So um, it's a great resource. So this is the um, these are some of the steps we follow in constructing renewable assignments. Um, first of all, before we even start any um, assignment project. In our courses, we conduct workshops on OER and open pedagogy, no matter in what content that we are teaching, uh, because it's important for students to be informed about what is OER, what is open pedagogy, connect them with the library resources as well and strategies. So we do a series of workshops and we share carefully crafted instructor guidelines. And I'm emphasizing this because students need to know what, what's gonna happen in that assignment. So we share objectives, deliverables, evaluation rubric. But this is again, an ongoing process. We ask their feedback, we kind of work on this together. So incorporate their feedback into these guidelines as well. So what do they do? They, they first um, ideate, so we identify the topic of of interest for the projects with students. Then they explore and research available um, open educational resources um, uh, online. And there's a lot of um, 
uh, scaffolding here. Exploring process is one of the most difficult processes for students because they may not necessarily know where to go, what to find, how to find, and how to evaluate the credibility of the resources. So there's a lot of training here. Uh, and they start developing the materials um, um, in collaboration with their peers. They revise the materials with user using peer and instructor feedback. So we do have peer feedback processes here, as well as instructor feedback. They reflect on their learning throughout the process uh, through a series of reflection exercises, and they share their um, the materials. It's important. This is also a celebration opportunity for them. And this is where they get excited the most because we share these um, resources online in several social media platforms. And Iowa State Library is a great resource to, for us to disseminate this work as well. Here's an example. This is um, um, a Pressbooks example. Um, um, ISU supports Pressbooks platform, and we um, I implemented this assignment as a you know semester long project with students taking my advanced instructional design course, and this is an online course, and students taking this course write uh, chapters for a book on learning environments design on several topics. And um, this is shared also through Iowa State Library and future students taking this course first study the material that are prepared by the students and then they contribute to this book with new chapters. So this is a living document. This is an ongoing project. And they get really excited because as I mentioned, this is not discarded. Uh, this is actually their work and effort is actually valuable for for people out there. We also um, we also see that um, people in other universities started using this uh, product and students are really excited about that. This is another example again on Pressbooks online learning toolbox. This one is used as a project in my um, course on online learning. This is again a graduate course and students develop uh, commentaries on different topics of online learning. And I think, um, yeah, there's this is a detailed um, screenshot here. You see some of those topics on the left panel. Students write commentaries and they write discussion questions. So future students come study those questions and share new chapters um, in this um, online learning toolbox. And again, this is an important resource for me as an instructor, because as I mentioned, this field is just changing rapidly. So the, um, I, I, I need updates constantly on a resource. So I don't need to find a textbook, printed textbook that will be really old next year, right? So online resource like this is really help for me as an instructor, as a resource as well. So this one was a wiki book actually that I developed in 2000, back in 2013 without knowing that this was an open pedagogy practice. And uh, this, this one I developed with my students back when I was teaching in Turkey and students wrote chapters of uh, about a topic, uh, which is called TPAC, it's a theoretical frame. And what happened though after this, um, people studying this topic around the world started using this work and citing this in their research um, articles. And students were fascinated by that. They weren't really expected, expecting this back then. And they really were excited about this resource and seeing how people around the world can come and read their work. Um, this one is um, a different case because, you know, I teach education, educational technology courses, but this one, <laughs> was supported again by the um, um, Miller Open Mini uh, Grant at ISU, was taught by an instructor in um, um, uh, ecology, Boris Jovanovic. He integrated this work into the Perspectives of Aquatic Toxicology course as a wiki book. This is the only open book that exists on this topic. So um, students, and this is also taught to undergraduate students, so they also get to contribute to, to the processes. There's a lot of scaffolding, again, through the creation of this book. I think this semester he is also implementing it, so new chapters are coming and will be integrated into this uh, wiki book. Uh, so these were some of the open book examples 
examples we develop with students, but we also develop multimedia materials uh, with students. And here, um, another example here we implement in my online course about online education is that students um, conduct interviews with uh, practitioners in online education and um, they connect to them, they create this professional dialogue around online education, construct interview questions, record these interviews, edit these interviews and share in our YouTube channel. And this has been a really a nice resource for students who are interested in learning more about instructional design, uh, open education and so forth. So this is a multimedia material that we develop. So um, we also develop and curate resources with students. Uh, we use Google Sites extensively. This is another toolbox we developed. Uh, so students shared um, a number of resources uh, for K-12 teachers. Here our audience was K-12 teachers. So they developed a series of um, you know, resources, tools, materials for K-12 teachers interested in teaching online. And we shared that in our um, Google Sites website. Um, another example here, this time students developed an open online course um, and um, they went through the whole course development processes, they did need that needs analysis and then designed the materials, engaged in peer feedback, um, and then they developed these online modules that were shared in Canvas Commons. So um, again, students taking this course in the future would come and study these online modules um, as part of my course content and add new modules to the topic. So as I mentioned, we um, really try to carefully craft these assignments because this is not student, something students are used to. So they need a lot of guidance, especially undergraduate students. Uh, so this is a rubric that is developed for the Aquatic Toxicology Wikibook, um, uh, Wikibook assignment and students get to see how their work would be evaluated. And this rubric is also used by the peers to give peer feedback. Uh, peer feedback is not something easy. Again, you need to give a lot of training about how to give constructive feedback to your peers. But again, we think that it's an important skill to learn and practice in a, in a course setting. So this is the open pedagogy in action model. Um, um, we are continuously implementing this model again in our undergraduate and graduate courses. Um, you don't need to necessarily implement that as a semester long project. This can also be one week or two week assignment taking bits and pieces. Uh, so you don't need to implement all these components actually, but you can just use like development and reflection, or you can just use developing and development and peer feedback. Uh, that would be still considered as um, a renewable assignment. So I'll just share um, in the last uh, five, uh, 10 minutes or so is the, the results of our research. So throughout all these processes and projects, we conduct collected data to understand how students perceive the impact of these practices. And we found that students' knowledge and awareness of open ac access increased uh, because we were teaching them about guidelines for open access. And their awareness of ethical issues and socioeconomic impact of OER improved, as well as sense of responsibility towards the broader community. And, um, uh, you know, the student agency is a, an important outcome here because this affects students' perceived learning experiences in a positive manner, uh, especially when you give guidance, direction, scaffolding, and uh, feedback. Um, but there were some issues and challenges, and I'll share more about that soon. But um, students had some fears of criticism from the public and peers. Um, they may not necessarily know how to give peer feedback again. So these can restrict their engagement with the processes. So that's why there has to be a, um, a lot of activities around building trust, confidence uh, to motivate uh, students and provide them with support. OEP can empower learners uh, to take ownership of their learning and create, adapt, or build uh, on prior OER. Um, especially now, my students, when they see what we did with students in the previous semesters, um, they see these examples. I think sharing examples are really important. Also, students' insights with future students. So they feel like they're part of a larger community. And that 
you know, participation in the community really motivates and encourages them. Uh, the, the other challenges is, um, you know, level of trust. And this is something we need to work more, openness and trust. Um, again, sometimes students may not want to share their work online with their names because they may not uh, feel confident enough to, to put the work out there. And I think you should uh, be okay with that. And we provide students options not to share their names. Uh, we also talk a lot about, uh, you know, the, uh, the evaluation of OER. So how do you get to evaluate existing OER and how do you evaluate your own materials now? Another um, uh, um, issue that emerged from our work was the, uh, the idea around time consuming. So some students found this process really time consuming because they had to work a lot actually on building these resources but again i think communicating with them the value of this process can be important to address this um, copywriting issues and resources uh, coherence and consistency was another challenge you need to be coherent among different students work that's why peer feedback is really important here so I want to highlight the importance of inclusivity here and diversity. Content creation and knowledge sharing are not automatic processes with guaranteed outcomes. So there are a lot of critical points here, like digital literacy, students' digital literacy, access to resources, uh, confidence, capability, Supporting and sustaining dialogue among instructors and practitioners in higher education is critical here to create this inclusive environment. Now, I'm seeing in the OEP literature more work on diversity, more work on inclu inclusivity, including diverse voices in the creation of OER. So these are important, as well as creating inclusive spaces, addressing any inequalities of diverse groups in these processes, I think are important. So some recommendations from work. I think the most important work is designing professional development around um, the integration of open pedagogy practices in um, higher education uh, and you know K-12 uh, context and uh, really supporting them. We, uh, I think instructors, faculty, teachers need a lot of support and start implementing open educational practice in courses. And just mentioning that this is one step, um, you know, you don't need to do it as a large project, just, you know, try, start somewhere and build on it. Modeling successful examples are important. That's why uh, the OER Trailblazers website at Iowa State is great because the, the website recognizes faculty's work, but also share and model these practices. Developing students' open access literacy is important. I think it's an important skill, no matter what you teach, um, because a lot of students are now, um, um, you know, exploring open educational resources due to the cost of textbooks. So in all courses, I think, university-wide especially, we need to teach them this skill, open access literacy. Scaffolding and providing feedback at different stages is important and also sharing and celebrating students work and empowering them in, in this process as well. So this is our model and uh, feel free to use and adapt in your context. And lastly, I would like to mention um, that we, uh, during the pandemic, we look back our practices and we adapted a human centered frame uh, to design online courses and um, remote teaching experiences. And we, um, and this is published in, in the Journal of Technology and Teacher Education, and we emphasize the empathy building um, constantly. And this is something that is very important, um, especially in the pandemic, because we need to really understand uh, how students are going through certain challenges and situations, making the content relevant to their authentic experiences and building a community of inquiry around it. So these are all connected to our open pedagogy practices. So this is me uh, and the presentation on open pedagogy in action. Uh, feel free to connect me through these um, websites and I'm looking forward to your questions now. I'm just going to stop sharing. Sure. Thank you very much for, for, for that very enlightening presentation. Does anybody have any um, questions that they'd like to ask? It looks like, uh, OK, if there's an instructor thinking about getting into open pedagogy for their course, but they haven't done any of this work before, where would you recommend they start? 
I think the first thing is the, the reason I shared some inspirational examples because you really need to see how others have done this work. That's why I think um, um, Abby shared the Trailblazers website. Just check out what is out there, like the openpedagogy.org uh, that uh, you know Robin DeRosa uh, created. And there are several other resources um, um, out there for K-12 teachers as well. For example, I'm just going to share edtech books.org. Uh, this is uh, used a lot in, I, I hope I typed this correctly, but a lot in, by K-12 teachers as well, just to see examples, to be inspired. That's where I start first, to see what others are doing. And the second thing, I think looking at your own practices and see, okay, maybe I can convert this assignment. Like do not try to think big first, just think about about a, a small assignment that you can, you know, um, revise and work around to make an, you know, um, renewable assignment and then work from there. Um, that's my advice because then you test, you pilot, and then you go bigger, maybe a bigger project. But first thing I would say, check other people's work and, you know, or inspirational sources. Great. So a lot of your students are pre-service teachers, it sounds like, or, or will be teachers eventually? So we have uh, different programs here. We have graduate programs in educational technology. These are, some of the students are practicing K-12 teachers. So they are enrolled in our online master's program on educational technology. So they get to literally learn a lot about OER and integration of OER in K-12 settings. We also have pre-service teacher education courses that we teach and use open educational resources. So both in-service and pre-service. We also teach in, in instructional design certificate programs. So we have practicing instructional designers or people interested in learning more about instructional design. So we have a diverse group. Uh, that's why sometimes it's challenging for me to adapt the course content to these different needs, but open pedagogy really helps me because then I can connect to students authentic cases because they develop their the learning material that they will be learning about. So it's really, uh, you know, it's helping me adapt uh, thing, the content to their needs. Do you know if any of them have gone on to use um, OEP or OER in their own teaching? I think so, and um, not I think so, I know so because they, so what's, what interesting thing is, once they go through, especially teachers, they start implementing similar practices in their own context, and then I get excited. I'm like, oh my God, now this is having a big impact because they take something from the class and they really like it, and they implement it with their students, and then they get feedback and they share that feedback with me. And they also use these resources, especially students teaching in higher education programs, they use like the online learning toolbox in their own courses as a resource. So you see this, you know, growing community of my students, students are also using and creating and contributing. So this is really exciting. That's great to hear. Yeah, it does seem to be that that's kind of often how it happens with these sorts of things. Yeah. Um, the most contagious. <laughs> All right, we have a question um, from Anne Marie. She said, some faculty might be concerned about the potential class time commitment for helping students develop tech proficiencies and learn about copyright licensing. If this leaves less time for disciplinary content, um, how are they, that they're supposed to get through? Um, sorry, I kind of botched the reading of that, but how would you respond to that concern? This, this is a great question. Um, that's why we uh, implemented uh, this model. So in education courses, you know, it's connected to education because it's a course about online teaching. It's a course about teaching, but what do you do when you implement it in a topic like aquatic toxicology, right? So it's a whole different topic. You know, students may feel like, well, why am I learning these topics? It's not about what I learned, right? So it's really, I think you need to get a lot of buy-in from your students. Um, at the beginning of the semester, communicating this whole idea with them instead of imposing the pedagogy on them. That's why it's a participatory pedagogy. Sharing that this is um, an important skill and we are going to develop these resources together. And through the, your participation in this project, you not only you will be learning, but you will be also connecting with a larger community on toxicology because they get to you know, connect to the experts on that topic. They get to um, collaborate, uh, share this resource with a larger community. So they need to understand the value. Once they do it, I think 
um, there is less of a discussion about whether this is a waste of time, but really understanding how this can benefit me and the larger community. And, um, you know, this is also about you know, when you implement active learning strategies in your classroom, sometimes students will be like, oh, don't do it, just teach me, right? So, so really explaining them this is a process, a, you know, learner-centered process. This is, a, you know, helping you learn. This is helping me grow. This is helping us grow. So, um, but yes, there has to be a time commitment on teaching students at the beginning of the semester about open access. But for me, I think this has to be a topic for all students in all courses. You know, I'm a big um, passionate believer of open educational resources. Students need to understand. And I think they will now, as they are exposed to these strategies, they will demand that from us. So I think we need to connect students with library, open access services, learn, practice, be informed. We need to connect to student organizations that they need to share these practices with their peers. Um, so this has to be, I think, a university-wide initiative um, in higher education institutions. Yeah, I think that's, that makes sense and is kind of an interesting point. It kind of reminds me there's a lot of librarians on this call about um, sort of like information literacy instruction and how, you know, um, it's sort of seen as best practices to sort of integrate information literacy into, into courses over and over throughout a student's career. And I would think that open access literacy would be sort of similar to that. Yeah. All right, does anybody else have any other questions or comments? No? Okay, well with that, um, I think we can wrap it up a little early unless um, anybody has anything else they'd like to talk about. I just would like to mention one last thing. Um, I think um, to encourage faculty to do, you know, spare time, also invest time actually on these initiatives, there has to be some structures within the universities or within, you know, schooling context to motivate them. So that's why we really appreciated the uh, Miller grants uh, that supported our work so, because we could get help from you know, graduate students, undergraduate students to help us develop these materials or you know, work with an editor because you know, your work will be out there. So you want to make sure you produce high quality work or you get help with multimedia development and so forth. So this is an important resource allocation for a university to encourage and motivate faculty. So um, I think there has to be, you know, initiatives like that within universities. Absolutely. Yeah, the institutional support is pretty crucial for getting this work done. Yeah. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for this enlightening presentation. I think, you know, we've heard a lot from other presenters about developing resources. So it's really interesting, I think, to hear about um, kind of the pedagogical practices um, that can underpin those resources. So um, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. And, um, and yeah, I would like to just say um, great work that you're doing. And, and I'll post this recording on um, YouTube later today for those of you who are interested in seeing that. Thank you for the invitation. Great to connect to you. Thanks.